Sabbath to each of you. It's so good to be with you here in New Smyrna Beach. We have been challenged to get here. You know, we were supposed to have been here a few weeks ago, and it didn't work out. Coming down this week, we were challenged that God had brought us here safely. Amen. We're glad to be here with you. Thank you for the special music. I so much enjoy classical music. You know, I've, I've spent many years of ministry in the Adventist church, and when I see in the bulletin where it says special music, sometimes I get a little bit scared. Because before I was a Christian, I was in the world of rock and roll. I love rock and roll. And I left that, came into the church. And these days, now sometimes you hear music in church that scares you. But I so much thank you for that special music. Now, I'm not here by myself. I brought my sweetheart with me. I'd like her to stand up so you can see my wife, my Amen. lovely wife. Amen. We have been happily married for 33 years. So we're a little bit ahead of you, uh, Marty and Deborah. But uh, God has blessed us. Amen. And my wife... I call her sweetheart, but you shouldn't call her sweetheart. Her name is Sandra. I don't call her Sandra, but that's what you should call her. And we have had the privilege of being work, being together in 33 years of, of marriage. 28 of those have been with Amazing Facts. How many of you are familiar with Amazing Facts? We joined Amazing Facts when Joe Cruz was still alive. And a year later, he died. Then came Doug Batchelor. We've had the privilege to work with Doug for 27 years. And we spent much of our ministry, at least starting out, in Eastern Europe. We began doing meetings in the former Soviet Union, in Ukraine. And you can see the picture. We would often have capacity crowds. Well, as our children got older, they grew up in evangelism. When they got old enough, they wanted to go to AFCO. And so we went to AFCO, and then after that, we got involved with AFCO. You know what AFCO is? Amazing AFCO Church. is the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism. And after we went through, of course, our children went through. I was one of the teachers there. We, the children finished. <clears throat> Amazing Facts challenged us to go start AFCO in the Philippines. We spent three and a half happy years working in the Philippines. Started PAFCO, Philippine AFCO, which is ongoing now. And then while we were there, we had an African who came to Philippines to, because it was cheaper than coming to America. So he came there, went through our training, and after the training, he said, well, we need this program in Africa. While we were in Manila, Pastor Doug came and did a meeting, an evangelistic meeting, and while he was there, this student went to Doug and said, we need AFCO in Africa. Would you send the Hargraves to Africa? So we ended up leaving Philippines and going to Africa. We spent four and a half years in Africa. First in Kenya, and then in Uganda. I was on the phone this week with our team. There are 35 people in Africa working for Amazing Facts. All graduates of AFCO Africa. And their stories are exciting. 
But anyway, they're having a few challenges there because COVID has come back. They went through the lockdown like we did. And now they're having a second wave. I guess you've heard perhaps that Uganda is in lockdown. Kenya, part of Kenya is in lockdown. So doing evangelism when you're in lockdown is a little more different, difficult than when things are open. And so we, were, we spent some time by Zoom. I never heard of Zoom until COVID came along. But now we're Zooming everywhere. Zoom to Sabbath school and Zoom church and Zoom meetings. We had a Zoom meeting this week with our team, our team of evangelists, uh, discussing how to do evangelism when there's a lockdown. And there are ways. Last year, I'm, this is not part of my presentation. Last year, our team, the Amazing Facts team in Africa, during COVID lockdown, led over 2,000 people to baptism. Now, how that happened, only God knows. But the work of evangelism is still going on in Africa. And they say that when you go to Africa as a missionary, your heart stays there. And I can testify that's so true. My wife and I, we enjoyed our time in Africa. We are looking forward, if God opens the way, to going back to Africa. Here is one of our trainings. <coughs> We do these Sunday trainings for those who can't come to the full-time training where we teach church members on Sundays how to be soul winners. We have two trainings. I share, which is personal evangelism. I preach, which is public evangelism. This was our largest class. We had over 180 students in that particular session. We had many, I think we had 100 university students. When you get young people inspired to share their faith, things happen. Right. And it's amazing what God has done in Africa and is doing in Africa. We are glad to be here with you in New Smyrna Beach. I'd never been to New Smyrna Beach until this morning. Came driving in this morning. We were supposed to be here yesterday, but like, like I say, circumstances change things. So we got here this morning. And we are looking forward to working with you in evangelism starting Friday night. I like your theme. Walking together in Christ through prayer, love, health, and sharing. We're going to be sharing evangelism. So we invite you to invite someone. We recently finished a meeting in Montana about a month ago, two months ago. There was an Adventist there who is 90, was she 95, 96? I mean, she's so old, she's blind. But she invited her neighbor, she invited another neighbor, she invited another neighbor, and she invited all these neighbors. She got, I think, three neighbors to come. One of them got baptized. And one is, well, we're hoping she continues. This is a, uh, a friend of hers who's 86. It's hard to change when you're 86, but she's still coming, coming to church. We hope she will eventually take the step. So there's a 95-year-old woman who got one person baptized and another person coming to church, who we hope will get baptized. If a 95-year-old person can do that, what can you do? God wants to use you, so we invite you to invite someone. We have these uh, Save the Date cards. Some of you probably have seen our flyer. Did you get the flyer yet? Yes. Already? Yes. Some of you got it already. It's supposed to go out this week. Oh, no, I mean the box to pass out to the congregation. Okay, yeah. so where are those flyers? We should get them out. And every, Did everybody get one last week? Yes. That was okay. Good. Well, we want to have them available so you can take some to a friend or a family. We have these little cards, which are handy. Uh, you can take a stack of them, share them this week at work, <coughs> invite a work, a work associate or a, a neighbor, and we will probably early in the week also have a smartphone advertisement. We haven't finished that yet, but we'll get that to you. I've been uh, getting these messages from your family, New Smyrna Beach family. 
I was included on your, what's it called, the call, the call one, center, one, or the call, what is it, the one announcements? Call. One call. The one call. So I get these one calls, so I'll have to send you a one call with the smartphone advertisement you can share with your family, friends, neighbors, anybody. Today for our worship hour, I have a topic I've entitled, The War of the Woes. And before we study God's Word, I'll invite you once more to bow your head with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be together here at New Smyrna Beach to worship. We pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts now as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. During the Protestant Reformation, which started in Germany with Martin Luther, and then was carried on by his associate Melanchthon, as time progressed, divisions and schisms began separating the Protestant leaders, the Protestant cause, and Melanchthon, recognizing the disastrous effect of disunity on the cause of Protestantism, he published a parable called The War of the Wolves. In an effort to reunite all these Protestant leaders and Protestant churches, and according to the parable, the wolves were somewhat fearful of the upcoming war with the dogs, because they had heard that there were very many dogs and the dogs were very strong. And so the wolves decided they would send a spy wolf out to spy on the dogs. This is children's story part two. And when the spy wolf came back to report what he had seen, he said, it is true, there are very many dogs. But he said, I didn't see very many mastiff dogs among the dogs. You know what a mastiff dog is? A mastiff is one of the world's largest dogs. Here's a, an extra large mastiff. Here's another picture of a mastiff dog. They are quite large. The Mastiff dog was originally bred in Europe for the purpose of protecting the, the flocks and herds of farmers from the wolf. They were also used in warfare, so the Mastiff dog was a, a war dog and an anti-wolf dog. So the spy wolf is telling the pack of wolves, I didn't see very many Mastiffs among the dogs. He said, what I did see was all sorts of dogs. You couldn't even count all the breeds and all the types and dogs. But he said, the worst of them were the little ones. <laughs> Which he said, bark very loudly, but cannot bite. But he said, what encouraged me that we will win the war with the dogs was this. He says, as I watched the dogs as they were marching along, I noticed they were all snapping right and left at one another. And he said it be became very clear to me that while the dogs hate the wolf, they also hate each other with all their hearts. <laughs> you understand the lesson of the story? All too often we end up snapping right and left at one another in the church when we ought to save our fangs, our teeth for the enemy. We have an enemy, right? Who's the enemy? It's not the elder, it's not the deacon, it's not your the other person across on the other side of the church. Who's the enemy? It's the devil. And in the Bible, he is likened to a wolf in John 10. He's likened to a lion in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. He's also symbolized in Revelation and prophecy as a dragon. In fact, if you have your Bible, I was planning to be unpacked yesterday, long before the Sabbath, but I didn't even get to my destination, so I ended up with just my little pocket Bible. At least I have one. If you have your Bible, open your Bible to Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17, a familiar text, I think, to Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 12, verse 17. Have you found that? can uh, use your Bible or your gadget. Uh, and the day has come and we, can, we should say, turn in your smartphone to Revelation 12, 17. You have a smartphone and you, you should have a Bible on it. 
but don't get distracted. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. Who's the woman? Church. Church. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who's the remnant? Us. Well, we believe that's us. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible says the devil goes to make war with the church, especially the remnant. The devil is not concerned about sleepy, lazy, Laodicean churches. But when a church gets inspired, gets enthused, active in sharing the gospel to its community, that church is a threat to the devil. And when a church goes to carry the gospel to its area, that church is invading enemy territory. And the enemy is very territorial. It's like the wolf. The devil, he responds by declaring war on the church. Are you ready for the battle? We're going to start the battle, right? This coming Friday. We're going to begin evangelism. We're going to pass out flyers. They've already gone. Well, they will be going this week by mail. You'll be passing out some to somebody, I hope. When we do evangelism, the devil gets mad. He declares war. Are you ready for the battle? I heard one amen. <laughs> what strategies do you think the devil would utilize as he seeks to defeat the soldiers of Christ in carrying the gospel to their community? What, and what, is the, what does a wolf try to do to a flock of sheep? Scatter. Scatter the flock. What's the best thing the flock can do to defend itself? Stay together. Press together. You have heard probably of an animal up in the north called the musk. Oxen. The musk ox has only one natural enemy, that's the wolf. And when a pack of wolves encounters a herd of musk oxen, the oxen quickly gather into a tight circle with their young, their weak on the inside, the strong ones with their horns facing outward. As long as that circle stays tight, stays closed, there's nothing that the wolf can do to harm the musk oxen. So the wolves, they run around and around that circle trying to, to break up the circle because they know that if the circle breaks and runs, they're going to have their meal. And there's a lesson for us. We must press together. The devil will seek to bring about division as we do evangelism. Listen to what the counsel is. I read this from volume 5 of the Testimonies. Page 488. It says this, Let each one who claims to follow Christ esteem himself less and others more. Press together. Press together. In union there is strength and victory. In discord and division there is weakness and defeat. These words have been spoken to me from heaven. As God's ambassador, I speak them to you. What's the message from heaven? Press together. Press together. Press together. In union there is strength and victory. In discord and division there is weakness and defeat. Do we need victory in the work of evangelism? Yes. yes. So what must we do? Press together. Press, together. Press together. As we've done evangelism, my wife and I, for 28 years... We've seen the devil do all sorts of things to try to stop the spread of the gospel. When we were in Ukraine years ago, we'd be preaching along, myself and my translator, and suddenly there'd be a pop and there'd, there would be no lights. The electricity would go off in the whole region. And we would be, you know, it'd be nighttime, we'd be sitting in this enormous hall with no lights, dark outside, darker inside, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. I learned by experience to carry a little pocket flashlight. This was before the days of smartphones. This was in the 90s, the early 90s. And so yeah, I got this little pocket flashlight. We pull out, I'd pull out my flashlight and we would find the candles. We would light a candle on our table. My translator and I, we would continue preaching. You can't let the devil win. No PA. Get a thousand people in front of you with no PA. Well, you got to learn how to preach. 
No lights, no projector. We, back in those days, what we had for projector was the old Kodak with the carousel. So we did evangelism with for many years. We keep preaching. I remember one time we were doing a evangelistic series in Ukraine. It was the winter. Some of you come from Michigan. You had a real winter there in Michigan. There's no real winter in Florida. If you want to see a real winter, you go to Ukraine. We were in the, the in Ukraine in the winter doing a meeting. We had six inches of ice on the roads. We had two accidents, my wife and I getting to the site. When we drove into the city, we slid into the city. The first thing that happened, I got out of my car and I, I fell down. It was so slippery. It was the first place in my life where I saw people ice skating down the sidewalks. In spite of the cold, in spite of the ice, we advertised our meeting. We had 1,500 people coming to a hall. The hall, I think, seated 800 or something like that. They were crowded in in their, hope, their coats and their mittens and their hats, an unheated hall. So we're preaching, my translator and I. Well, you can imagine... We faced some opposition. The devil didn't like what was happening, and so he inspired the director of the hall, who was from a different church, turn off the electricity. He turned off the lights, and there was a problem with the lighting in the hall. So for one whole week, we had no lights. I was glad that he left the power in the wall sockets. He left that on. So for one week, the entire audience that came and went through the light coming out of our projector we had one light bulb we strung up over the exit light so people could see their way out, but that's all the light we had. After a week, somebody from the hall or somebody from the audience called the city officials. They said, there's a problem with this hall. There's no lights. We don't know what's happening. And so the city officials called the hall director. What's the matter with your hall? <laughs> he turned the lights back on. Thank you. That same meeting, we had an Orthodox priest that stood at the door. He cursed everybody as they came in. And then as they went out, he cursed them again. They still kept coming. In spite of the cold, in spite of the ice, in spite of the opposition, we were doing another meeting, same country. I remember we did one week of health. I see health is in your, your motto here. We did one week of health, health expo. And then we advertised our prophecy meeting. The night we were to begin, the director of the entire state, they called him Oblis over there in Ukraine, the entire state, he called the hall director, he says, if you open that hall for that religious meeting, you're fired. So he locked the hall. We had a thousand people standing outside the hall with a locked hall, we couldn't get in. We got a bullhorn to talk to the crowd, the police were on the outskirts watching to see what we would do. We had no... No permission for an outdoor meeting. So we announced, we don't know what's happened. They've closed the hall. We're going to have to look for a new site. We went looking for a new hall. A few days later, we found a military hall, not under the control of the local government. We rented the military hall. We put up advertisements all over the city, continuing. We had a 1,000 people come out to the military hall to hear the gospel. Preached in a military hall. I can tell you story after story. We were, <clears throat> I was doing meetings in Zambia. The night I was to preach on the Sabbath, it started to rain. Now, this is an outdoor meeting. We had, I think, three tents, but the tents would only, they were small tents, and we had over a thousand people coming. So most of the audience is, is standing. They weren't even sitting. We had seats for about 50 people. So the old people would sit and everybody else would stand. Can you imagine holding an evangelistic meeting, preaching pop, unpopular truth, and having your audience stand for an hour to listen? That's what they do in Africa. So they're standing there and I'm preaching away. And it starts to rain. I thought, Lord, they're going to go home. It's raining. And they stood there and listened. They stood in the rain. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. When you do evangelism, the devil brings all sorts of difficulties. We were doing a meeting, I remember, in Virginia, here in America. 
the, the night before, the night we were to start, the, I think it was the same day we were supposed to start, I got a call from the, the principal of the school. We were rented a public school, a hall in a public school. Got a call from the principal. We're not going to let you do that meeting because this is a uh, mixing of, of church and state. I said, we have a contract. Well, we'll let you have the first meeting. After that, you've got to find a new place. So we had, I think we had 89 visitors opening night in the school. And I said to the audience, I said, you know how it is here in America. You can't even pray in a public school anymore. So they pulled the rug out from under us. We're not going to be able to continue our meeting here, but there's a church just one block away. And it was. It was just one block away, a local Adventist church. So I said, you come. We're going to preach the, from the Bible. You come. We had this. I think we lost two people in the transfer. Second night, we moved to the church. And they came through the rest of the series. I can tell you many stories, but what has hurt the work of the gospel the most is when the devil is able to get in and create division in the local church. We can deal with any kind of external opposition as long as we are united. Amen. And that's why the message from heaven is what? <laughs> press together, press together. In union there is strength and victory. In discord and division, there is weakness and defeat. As we work together over the next month, what do we need to do? Rest together. Rest together. Rest together. There are five reasons why we need to strive for unity <coughs> in evangelism. If you're taking notes, and I hope you do, mark down these five reasons. Reason number one is for strength and victory. Do we need that in the work of evangelism? Yes. Amen. There is a text from Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12 that I'd like to read with you. Turn in your Bible to Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12. My little Bible doesn't open up the same as my big Bible. I have to have my glasses to read it, too. Ecclesiastes 4, and we're reading verse 12. Did you find that? finding it. The Bible says, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Why not? Why is a threefold cord not quickly broken? Because Jesus is the third. Because there is strength in that union of cords. Amen. Take for example, you take a Put your wrists together and wrap a thread. Tie a thread around those your wrists. You can break it easy. You wrap that thread around five times, you can still break it easy. You wrap it around ten times, now it's getting hard to break it. You wrap that thread around 15 times, it's getting difficult. Wrap it around 20 times, now it's almost impossible. You wrap it around 25 times, and now it's virtually impossible. You can see there is strength in that union. We accomplish more when we work together. There is strength in unity, and that's why we need to work together. We are strong when we are united. Some of you may have seen the geese migrating. I guess they're done migrating by this time of year. Do, do, do the geese fly over Florida? Have you seen them? Well, you've seen geese migrate, maybe not here, but they do migrate. Have you ever noticed how they're flying generally in a V formation? Why a V? Don't know. Well, we do know. Natural science does know why. As each goose flaps his wings, he creates an uplift of air for the goose behind him. And so by flying in a V formation, the flock of geese is able to travel at least 71% farther than if each goose was flying alone. And the lesson for us is we accomplish more when we work together. And if a goose falls out of the formation, he feels the wind, the resistance, the drag of having to fly alone. 
and the lesson for us, if we have as much sense as the goose, <laughs> is when we fall out of unity with our brothers and sisters in the church, we need to get back into unity so we can take advantage of the lifting power of the, Amen. those with us. Amen. Something else we can learn from the geese as they're flying along, you hear them honking. And what natural science has found, the geese in the back of the formation are the ones that are doing the most honking to encourage those flying out in the point to keep up their pace, keep up their speed. And the lesson for us, if we're flying along in the back of the church, if we're going to be honking at all, we ought to be honking encouragement. Amen. All too often, we get...